Good morning, church. It is good to see you this morning. I want to say a shout out to everyone who's joining us online and special shout out to those at Forward Ingersoll and Forward Kitchener who are joining us for the sermon this morning. Take your Bibles, turn to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, it's page 588 if you're using a Bible underneath the seat in front of you. And uh, while you're opening up to that passage of scripture, uh, I just want to uh, share how excited we are for this season we find ourselves in as a church family. And I have a special request of you uh, today. So you heard Pastor Derek mention that uh, Pastor Khalil and his family would be arriving. They were supposed to arrive this past week. But there is like some type of an airline strike or something in Germany. And uh, so they are now arriving tomorrow, Lord willing. And uh, here's what we need. We have been trying to find at least some temporary housing for them as a family, possibly something that's more long-term as well. So if you have any leads on some potential housing options for Pastor Khalil and Julia and their two boys, uh, please talk to me after the service or drop me an email, and uh, we'll try and connect the dots to uh, help them get a place to settle in as they arrive here in Canada to lead this Arabic ministry in the days ahead. All right, let me ask you a question. What is a moment in your life where you just felt the weight of how unfair life can be? A moment where you just knew life is so unfair. There are very few things in life that make me really angry and get me really agitated. But like most of you, believe it or not, I had one or two of those moments during COVID. And uh, uh, one of those moments during COVID uh, was actually related to my mom. My mom lived in a long-term care home, uh, and, and my mom was immune compromised. So I was all in on doing everything possible to help my mom and the people around her to be safe. But there were some rules that came out that just boggled my mind during COVID. One of the rules that really frustrated me was uh, th this one. I was not allowed to go and stand outside of my mom's window with her window closed and talk to her on the phone. Don't ask me why. I can't explain it to this day. But it got me, like, frustrated and angry. And I just sat there going, like, this isn't right. This doesn't even make sense. And it isn't right that this can happen. Like, people need some type of connection, whatever it might look like, you know, and as much as we were all adjusting to things, people need some type of connection. And she was alone and isolated in her room, and there was no opportunity to even just have that face-to-face -face connection through a window during that time. I talked to politicians. I talked to healthcare providers. I talked to management at the nursing home. And I kept saying these words, this just isn't right. It's not fair. People need this kind of connection. And, you know, when you see people who are hurting and they're struggling in their life, it can be really difficult, right, to find any meaning in the mess that they're facing. When you feel those moments in your own life where it just feels like life isn't right, like life is unjust, it can feel difficult to find any meaning in the mess of that. Why does life seem so unfair at times? Should we even expect life to be fair? Well, that's the question that we're going to tackle in this passage of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Begin reading at verse 16. So just follow along in your Bibles as I start at verse 16. I also observed under the sun, there is wickedness at the place of judgment, and there is wickedness at the place of righteousness. I said to myself, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, since there is a time for every activity and every work. I said to myself, this happens so that God may test the children of Adam, and they may see for themselves that they are like animals. For the fate of the children of Adam and the fate of animals is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath. People have no advantage over animals since everything is futile. All are going to the same place. All come from dust and all return to dust. Who knows if the spirits of the children of Adam go upward and the spirits of animals go downward to the earth. I have seen that there is nothing better than for a person to enjoy his activities because that is his reward. For who can enable him to see what will happen after he dies? Again, 
I observed all the acts of oppression being done under the sun. Look at the tears of those who are oppressed. They have no one to comfort them. Power is with those who oppress them. They have no one to comfort them. So I commended the dead who have already died more than the living who are still alive. But better than either of them is the one who has not yet existed, who has not seen the evil activity that is done under the sun. I saw that all labor and all skillful work is due to one person's jealousy of another. This too is futile in the pursuit of the wind. The fool folds his arms and consumes his own flesh. Better one handful with rest than two handfuls with effort in a pursuit of the wind. You know, whenever we see injustices happening in our society and in culture, governments start to act and laws start to be created. We create rules to deal with injustices so that they won't keep happening in the future, so we can hold people accountable. And, and sometimes we even make rules for the strangest of things, right? Like in Turin, Italy, somebody decided they needed to fight for what was fair for dogs. So it is illegal to not walk your dog at least three times a day in Turin. In Scotland, somebody decided we need to fight for what's fair for people's bladders. And, and so there is a rule in Scotland that if someone shows up, a, neighbor sh a perfect stranger shows up to your house one day and knocks on the door and says, I need to use the washroom, you have to let them in to use your washroom, no questions asked. And in Samoa, in an effort to fight for what's fair for women, it is illegal to forget your wife's birthday. <laughs> I am never moving to Samoa. <laughs> but you know what? No matter how many laws we create, no matter how many rules we come up with in life, injustices still seem to happen, right? Things still seem to go wrong. And I'm sure that you could tell me stories of things that you've experienced in your own life. I know all of us look at the world around us. We see the news of famine and war and refugees and economic situations and so many other global challenges. And we can see and acknowledge and admit that there are injustices all over the place. Well, the teacher in Ecclesiastes, he looks at the state of the world that he's living in, and he comes to this startling observation in verse 16. His observation is this, that on this earth, there is no guaranteed safe space from the experience of injustice. He says there's wickedness at the place of judgment and the place of righteousness, that there are places you and I, we kind of expect to see injustices. Like, there are parts of certain cities you go, I just know I'm not going into that part because things can go wrong there. But, but his point is, yeah, it happens in those places, but unfortunately, injustice is everywhere. Like, as great as it is for us to have a justice system here in Canada, our justice system does not always get things right. According to a study from Carleton University, wrongful conviction rates in Canada are about one in every 20 defendants. You, you would like to think that places like schools and your family are places that are safe from injustices taking place. But unfortunately, we all have stories where we can say that's not the case. I, I wish that I could tell you that Church is a place that will always be safe from injustices taking place. But I cannot tell you that. I cannot promise you that. Over the past several years alone, there have been so many examples of spiritual and sexual abuse by leaders in churches. And so many lives end up damaged and broken because of the unjust actions of a few people. And in this passage of Scripture... Uh, the, the teacher actually breaks down two different types of injustices that he's observing that are going on. In verse 16, he uses the word wickedness. Wickedness is like violence and crimes against civil law. It's the kind of injustice you would expect when you think about injustice. It's, it's people who are breaking the law. So when you think about abuse and financial fraud and unjust wars and any of those kinds of situations, people stealing things from someone else, those are the kinds of injustice that he's seeing when he uses the word wickedness. 
But there's another word that he uses down at the very beginning of chapter 4 and verse 1. He uses the word oppression. Now, oppression is something that might be legal, but it's still wrong. The, the big idea of oppression is that you are seeking your own profit at the expense of someone else. You're not really thinking or caring about the needs and the rights of other people along the way. In the Bible, oppression usually shows up whenever it's talking about the poor, when it's talking about widows, when it's talking about fatherless children, immigrants, and those who are powerless for any number of reasons. Those are usually the groups of people that show up when you see the word oppression in, in the Bible. Oppression is about the abuse of power, whether it's financial power, relational power, on others who are not as powerful as you. We see it with money, we see it with racism, we see it in workplaces, we see it anywhere where it is possible for a power structure to exist. And oppression is something that still happens today. Let me give you some examples. Man, I love that line of clothing. It doesn't really matter to me that those clothes were made through child labor on the other side of the world. I, I enjoy watching porn. It gives me a space to where I can just relax and get away from all the stresses of life. Who cares about the reality that most of the people who are the victims of pornography are people who are caught in human sex trafficking? That the porn industry funds human sex trafficking in our world. Or I can give someone a loan and I can make money off of them by charging extra interest from them. In Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 12 calls out people who make interest on loans. And verse 29 specifically says that taking interest on loans at the expense of people who are poor or who are immigrants is wrong in the eyes of God. It's not only in the Old Testament we see that. In James chapter 2, verse 6, we're told that, and we're called out for people who dishonor the, or, or, or oppress the poor. Oppression happens even in relationships. Even in marriages, oppression can happen. If you are seeking your own benefit at the expense of another person, you are oppressing them according to the Bible. Just because something is legal does not mean something is godly. People made in the image of God should not be oppressing other people who are made in the image of God. It is unjust. And when you stop and you think and you realize just how broad the biblical definition of injustice is, you soon realize that injustice really is everywhere, isn't it? But there is one ultimate reality you can count on. No matter what is going on in the world or what is going on in your own life, God will always have the final say on any injustice. We talked about this during our God Is series back in the fall. God is just. The Bible tells us that God is a father to the fatherless. He's a defender of widows. One of the main things that the Bible teaches us about God is that he takes up the cause of people who are powerless. If you have ever personally experienced an injustice, I want you to know this. God sees you. God knows exactly what you have gone through. And God promises that one day everything will be made right. He is just. He will make things right sometimes by providing for you now. But he will always guarantee that justice will be carried out in the end. He will make sure that every wrong that has ever been committed will be made right. But if we were honest with ourselves, the idea of God being the final judge sometimes still leaves us a little bit empty and with a lot of questions. And one of the questions I know it's left for me is, if God is just then why does he allow any injustice at all? And the teacher in Ecclesiastes is wrestling with that exact same question. 
And he gives himself, and he gives to us one answer. It's not the only answer in the Bible, but he gives one answer why injustice happens. And here's what he tells us. God allows injustice so that we can see our true character and our ultimate destiny. What he says in verses 18 to 21 is, as people, we don't act much differently than animals do. Well, side note, the teacher is not making a case for evolution in these verses. This is wisdom literature. Let's remember that. It's poetic in nature. Uh, If you want to get a better idea of what he's talking about, jump down to verse 4 of chapter 4. He puts it another way in that verse. He says, I see that all skillful work is due to one person's jealousy of another. What he means is, we as people find meaning and purpose in life by trying to get ahead of our neighbors instead of participating in community with them. His point is, it is possible that every single one of us is guilty or has been guilty of some type of injustice towards another person. That there is something inside of all of us that pursues our own best interests, and sometimes that means we pursue our own interests at the expense of other people. Even if the other person suffers, as long as I get where I want to be, that's the thing that matters. And he's saying you're behaving just like animals when you do that. Did you know that some of the most vicious creatures on the planet are ants? Ants separate the world in two ways. My colony and your colony. And if you are not part of my colony, ants are vicious. Like they will, they will pin you down and chop you to pieces. They, they, some of them will, will, will just spray things out, spray out toxins just to confuse their enemies. There's one kind of ant that has like this big beer belly. And, and the ant will actually go, when it feels like it's got an enemy around it, just to help its own cause, the ant kind of goes all kamikaze style, and he'll put pressure on his belly and pop his belly so that it sprays like a glue-like substance everywhere to stop other ants from being able to advance. It's like, I don't care who I hurt along the way as long as my side gets to win. Ants live like that. They're nasty. And people, believe it or not, can be the same. Here's the thing. You and I are not made to act like animals. Nothing else in all of creation is made in the image of God. In a Genesis 1 and 2 world, before sin comes and messes everything up, humans did not need to put others down in order to get ahead. We were made as people to treat each other with mutual respect and care. And every time you or I get ahead in any way at the expense of someone else, it shows that what we've done is we've made ourselves the center of the story instead of God. Every time an injustice happens in this world, it happens so that we can see just how far gone we are as humans. It reveals also to us just how much we need someone to save us from ourselves. Should life be fair? Yeah, life should be fair for all people. And Genesis chapter 1 and 2 shows us that. But my sin and your sin and the sin of humans throughout all of history has created injustices. And we have perverted the world that God calls very good. Now, I I need to say this as well. Life being fair does not mean that life is a free-for-all. Some of us cry out for justice in situations, but in reality, the truth is, we're living outside of God's boundaries of what God calls right. Right? When we live outside of what God calls right and we demand justice, be careful what you ask for. Because what you have done is you have actually been unjust towards God. You've come up with your own set of rules for life. Let 
the writer of Ecclesiastes tells us this, that the consequences of being unjust people is that we all share the same ending as an animal. You're going to die. Now, we know that the only hope we have is the good news of Jesus. Because apart from Jesus, you are completely lost and you are destined to one day face judgment from God for the contributions that you have made to the injustices of this world. God is just, but God is also merciful. That's good news, church. The, the only truly good person to ever live, his name is Jesus. He is the Son of God, and Jesus took the justice of God in your place on the cross. On that cross, God withheld from you the punishment that you deserve for your sin. That is mercy. And the only way that you can receive that mercy is to have faith in Jesus. You need to turn to him. You need to ask him for mercy. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Because of his great mercy, he's given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Call out to God and ask for mercy for your sins, and you'll receive mercy instead of his justice. If you're a disciple of Jesus and you've been forgiven of your sins, you live in this hope of what's coming, but you still live with the reality of what is. So how should a Christian respond to injustice? What should we do about the realities of injustice in the world? Well, the writer is going to give us some ideas. It's not a comprehensive list. This doesn't cover everything the Bible teaches. It talks about injustice a lot. But here's the first thing that we see in Ecclesiastes. First of all, enjoy your life without contributing to the injustice for other people. Like, he says this in verse 22 of chapter 3. He tells us, I've seen that there's nothing better than for a person to enjoy his activities. But here's the reality. Your life will go a long way if you just simply go from living for me to living for we. The, the Bible's not against you enjoying your life. The, the activities that take up your week should be something that bring you a sense of happiness, but not if they come at the expense of other people along the way. If you have to put down other people in order to have happiness, that's unjust. If other people have to suffer so you can get ahead, can you really say that you're loving your neighbor? Let me give you an example. Think about something like investments. Investments are good. You can make money off of investments. But do you know the story behind your investments? Are you profiting from investments that take advantage of people in some way? Harsh working conditions, unfair wages, child labor, property rentals that take advantage of the poor. Now, I don't believe that most of us set out to commit injustices against other people. But I do believe that the problem is most of us start from the posture of, not me, I'm not guilty of any injustices. It's everybody else that has all the problems. But what if your posture was this instead? How am I considering the needs of others as more important than myself? What if that was the starting point of your posture? Find ways to enjoy your life but do it without contributing injustices to other people. Now, I know that for some of you, that might be really challenging, especially if you are someone who has experienced injustice in your own life. You might be thinking, like, how could I ever enjoy my life with the injustices I've experienced? And sometimes it might even be tempting to exact revenge against someone who's committed an injustice towards you. But here's the reality. Perpetuating injustice never gets you anywhere. It just perpetuates a cycle that goes on and on, and sometimes from one generation to the next generation. And if you've been hurt and you're carrying the weight of that in your heart, and if you are someone who is perpetuating the cycle of injustice, I want you to know that healing and freedom are possible. 
It's one of the reasons why we offer a ministry like Freedom Session as a church, because there's so many people who've experienced this kind of hurt. But Jesus has a better story for your life than bitterness and revenge could ever give to you. So I want to encourage you to jump into Freedom Session when it starts again this fall. Now, it's also not enough for us just to avoid doing unjust things. We also need to have compassion for those who are experiencing injustice. That's what we see in the first three verses of chapter 4. The teacher looks at all the acts of oppression. And what he sees are people who are just overwhelmed by the realities of life. And there's no one there to comfort them. The, the weight is so great, he says, for some of these people, it would be better if they just never lived than to go through what they're going through. Yeah, ever felt that way before? That you see someone who's hurting so deeply and has experienced so much injustice, you wonder, oh, man, I wonder if they would just be better off having never had to experience this. Avoiding life altogether. You see a picture on the news of a child in a war-torn country, and you think, what, what kind of future exists for that child? But that perspective of thinking that people would be better off dead takes God out of the equation. Because God is a God of life. God is a God who believes in people experiencing life and finding life. Don't take God out of the equation. Every single person who has ever experienced any type of injustice is a person who has value and worth before God. And sometimes we jump ahead and we try to fix their problem, and sometimes we jump ahead and we think, meh, I don't think they've really actually experienced any injustice in their life. But what if you were to, before you jump too far ahead, you just stop and put yourself in their shoes for a minute? Stop and listen to their story. Stop and hear their experience. Have compassion for them. Imagine if we were the church that would weep with those who are weeping. See, there, there are people who see justice as an issue. But imagine if we were the church who were so like Jesus that we didn't see justice as an issue. We saw the people who need someone to love them. The people who need someone to show compassion towards them. Having compassion for people who've experienced injustice, it is core to being a follower of Jesus. Seriously, read through the Gospels and look at all the people where the Bible describes Jesus as having compassion. And over and over again, what you will see is Jesus having compassion for people who experience injustice. When Jesus gets angry in the temple, it's because of an injustice that's happening in the temple. It's because there are people who are putting up roadblocks, people in power putting up roadblocks for people being able to come to pray and worship God. It's an injustice. We are, have the opportunity to represent Jesus and the compassion of Jesus for those who are experiencing injustice. Where is God in the mess of injustice? I actually think God's right here. God's right here in the middle of Christian community. God's right here in the midst of his people. Because you and I, we get to be the hands and the feet and the voice of Jesus to those who are experiencing injustices. We represent his heart. And the good news is, I see this kind of compassion happening all over the place in our church. Uh, one of the partnerships that we have as a church is with the Cambridge Food Bank. We're a satellite location for their food market. And uh, we've also worked with them to create a community garden out in the back field. Uh, the Cambridge Food Bank, they had 2,500 emergency food hampers that are distributed every single month. That's a 54% increase over the previous year. One woman who uh, accesses the food market said this, she said, since I started getting sick, I've had to quit my job and go on ODSP. My oncologist told me this is your new full-time job. ODSP is basically starvation income. 
And the food market has helped me to have healthy food that I would not have been able to afford otherwise. It's literally been a lifesaver for me. And as a church, you are a part of compassionate stories like that one. I've heard the stories of discipleship groups in our church who are caring for others who have experienced injustices in relationships or in difficult economic situations. So many of you are serving our community in all kinds of different ways to show love to those who are being oppressed. You are showing yourself to be a church who cares and has compassion for those who are being oppressed and experiencing injustice. God's people should be known as the most compassionate people on the planet. Because we are children of a God who has shown so much compassion towards us. But I know that there's a challenge we all face with this. And the challenge is, how do you care about justice without becoming overwhelmed by all the needs? In Canada alone, there's about 84,000 different registered charities that are active. And that does not even begin to touch all the different global situations that you are aware of that, that needs people to show up and help. It can be easily, easy to be overwhelmed by all the needs that are out there. So is there a way to practice justice without getting overwhelmed? Well, the teacher teaches us a proverb right at the end of this passage in verses 5 and 6. And he give us, gives us three different postures that we can take when it comes to justice issues. Three postures with our hands. The first posture is this one. Fold your arms and just say, well, not much we can do about this. There's so many needs in the world, and I just don't have the time or the energy to help out with things. And we just fold our arms. And he tells us at the beginning of this proverb, the fool folds his arms and consumes his own flesh. He, he's saying, don't be foolish. Don't be self-centered. Don't just consume for yourself. There is no place for a Christian to fold their arms at injustice. It doesn't exist. You cannot be obedient to Jesus and just fold your arms at injustice. There's another posture that he talks about. Sometimes, some of us, we become super passionate about injustices. And so we pick up one cause or one need or one issue, and we carry it. But then there's another need that comes up. We're like, man, i got to pick up that one as well. And then there's another thing that comes up, and there's another thing that comes up, and there's another thing that comes up, and we're trying to carry all these things, all these different injustices all over the place. And we've got our arms full of trying to fix the world. And here's what always happens. When you are in this spot, and you are trying to pick up with both hands every single injustice that comes, I promise you, at some point, you are just going to move from a passionate person to an angry person. You are going to become disillusioned at other people because they're not measuring up to your standards. You're going to become exhausted personally because you're carrying too many injustices in your hands and you're trying to be Superman and fix the world. And you can't do it. It's exhausting. And it will not end well for you. Instead, what the writer of Ecclesiastes wants us to do is to practice the principle of one-handed care. You need to care, but you need to care for the things you can fit in one hand. Why? Because all of us have limitations. And your limitations are a reminder that you are not the God who is just. Every limitation you have is a reminder that there is only one person who's going to make sure that every wrong will be made right. Every limitation that you have gives you the opportunity to say, I can do this, but I can't do more than this. Why? Because I need my other hand to worship and rest and trust in a God who is faithful and good. When you're so busy having both of your hands full trying to fix the world, you have no space in your life to worship and trust 
and rest in the goodness and faithfulness of God. And some of you need to stop and slow down. I say this to you because I love you. And you're going to overwhelm yourself with trying to do more than what God has called you to do. We need to be a people who care about justice, who act on the injustices of the world in different ways, but who also rest in the goodness of a God who is fully just and trust him, trust him to make every wrong right. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you that you are the God who is just. Thank you for the privilege we have to be your hands and feet and voice in this world. And I pray, God, you would help us to do that well. But Lord, I also ask that you would help us to be people who would live and recognize our own limitations, who would take on the things that you've asked us to take on, but we also let other things go so that we can rest and trust in the faithfulness and the goodness of you. To recognize that we are not you. That you alone can make every wrong right. You are faithful and good. Help us in that, God, to trust you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.